This lesson deals with lab number six, which is the design and testing of a set of noise-canceling, eavesdropping headphones. Background sounds can still be heard when wearing a set of headphones. If we place the microphone in the headphone, we could also pick up these background sounds. As we've seen in previous experiments, microphone outputs are very small voltages, so we probably need to amplify this signal. Your ear acts as sort of a summing circuit in that you hear the summation of all the sounds presented to it. So if we took this background noise and we changed the sign of it and then added it to your headphone, then it would present a wave going in the opposite direction of the noise and it would cancel it. I normally use headphones to listen to some source of audio, so we'd also need to add this into our headphone. Now, if we add a microphone to our headphone, we could also use it to eavesdrop. In other words, have an amplification and pick up sounds. This design was described in an article in 1997 in a magazine called Electronics Now. One approach to designing a circuit or a system is to draw what is called a block diagram. This is a pictorial model of the circuit or system. Let's do this here for, say, the right channel of music, and then we'll replicate it for the left channel. We've got a pair of headphones on. I'm going to put a microphone near the earpiece, preferably actually inside of it, so I can pick up the background noise that my ear is going to pick up. I'm going to amplify that signal because it would be pretty small. I'm going to throw a switch and put it through an inverter, which will change the sign of it. Likewise, close the switch. And then I'm going to add that result to the music. And that result we put back into the earpiece, and so I'm now creating a, a replica of the background noise with the opposite sign. I'd also like to make this summer variable because I may need to adjust the gain of that amplifier that I picked up with the microphone. Also, maybe I'd like to have this source of music also variable so that I could control the volume of it, independent of the volume control on my MP3 player or whatever my source of music is. I also have a second position of the switch, is to take that microphone signal and not invert it and then add it to the music. So it becomes a set of eavesdropping headphones. How would you make a summing amplifier? Well, we actually did this in ECE 201 in Supplemental Problem 410, where we looked at an inverting summer. Here I've got two sources of sound, my music and then signal coming back from the microphone, either inverted or not inverted. And then we're going to sum these two results and put it out in one single channel. Let's take a look at analyzing the circuit again. So we solve for V out in terms of our input voltages V1 and V2. Now I have feedback around the op amp, so the voltage across input terminals is driven to zero because of the high gain of the amplifier. The current is zero because the resistance is very high. If I apply a voltage V1, a current's going to flow. Likewise, V2, a current's going to flow. I'll call that I1 and I2. The voltage across this resistor is going to be V1 minus zero. All of V1 is across R1. And likewise for V2, the voltage across here is V2 minus zero, so just V2. Current I1 is V1 over R1 and the current I2 is V2 over R2. Now those two currents come to this node and have to leave it. Since there's no current here, all of that current goes up into here. So then our output voltage, the rise in voltage, equals the drops around the loop. V out is equal to a minus the quantity V1 over R1 plus V2 over R2 times the resistor R sub F plus a drop of zero. Bring the R sub F inside, and I've got minus the quantity RF over R1 times V1 and then I've got RF over R2 times V2. So I have a summing of my amplifier voltages times the scale factor, and then that sum is inverted. So we may not need a separate amplifier to do the inversion. We've got this built into the summer. Now let's model this like we did other things in ECE 201. Let's write down all the things that we know as true about this circuit. Well, if I apply a voltage V1, a current I1 flows. It's equal to V1 over R1. Likewise, for the voltage source V2, I get a current I2 equal to V2 over R2. This looks like Ohm's law. The output is of fixed voltage, and I've got a voltage-controlled voltage source between the output and ground, and that has zero output resistance. We can put all that together into a model. So if I apply a voltage V1, a current I1 flows that has an Ohm's law relationship. Put a resistor R1 here. Current that's going to be flowing into here is going to be V1 over R1, and that's our I1. Likewise here, a resistor R2 will create the effect that when I apply a voltage V2, a current I2 will flow, which is V2 over R2. And then the output voltage is a negative of this summation. And I'm just going to flip that sign of the controlled source around to get that minus sign. So this node voltage is a negative, the quantity RF over R1 times V1 plus RF over R2 times V2. So now I have an inverting summer. Next, we need to adjust the gain of the signal picked up by the microphone so we can match that picked up by our ear so we can do cancellation with a sign change. It'd be also nice if we could adjust the volume of the music, and then we could use this as a volume control for our source of sound. One simple way to do that is to add a pot to the inputs of the summing inverter. 
put VN1 and VN2 be our, our music, and then our signal picked up by the microphone. Put a pot here between that input and ground, and hook that up to the summing inverter. And the input impedance of that circuit is just R1 and R2. Now if we pick the value of the potentiometer resistance to be about 10 times the value of R1, and likewise for the second pot, as we vary this pot, we'll vary the voltage exponentially. Our hearing is logarithmic, and so the sound levels will appear to be linear as we rotate the pot. In other words, if you had, say, full volume here with the pot up here, and then you dropped it to half the position, it would sound half as loud. That's because your ear is hearing the power levels, not the voltage. This was discussed in ECE 201 in Supplemental Problem 2.21. It's actually pretty tricky to put a microphone inside of a headphone. So what I'm doing was buying a set of commercial noise-canceling headphones, and these are shown right here. Here in this earpiece, if you look carefully, it's a little hard to see. There's holes. That's where the microphone is located. Now this set of headphones is kind of interesting because they had all the electronics in an external box. So we want to cutting the wire and making a connector to connect the two back together. So we can actually listen to how these noise canceling headphones sound. And then we're going to design the electronics that's in this box and then compare the two. Now what's interesting with this one is the gain is not adjustable and there's no eavesdropping feature with it. So we'll be able to compare our design and also add some features to it. The mount in the headpiece is a very special microphone. It's called an electret microphone. It's actually short for electrostatic and magnetic. This microphone consists of a diaphragm and a back plate, and this diaphragm is impregnated with charge, heated, and then sealed with a plastic coating. It actually forms a capacitor. The motion of the diaphragm by sound hitting it causes a change in capacitance. Now if the charge is constant, we have Q is equal to C times V, so then if the capacitance changes, then the voltage has to change. We're able to turn sound into a change in voltage. Change in voltage is very, very small. And so usually inside the microphone is an amplifier consisting of what's called a JFET transistor. It stands for Junction Field Effect Transistor. We'll talk about this in ECE 302. But whenever you have an amplifier, you actually have to provide what's called a biasing voltage, really a DC voltage, to get the transistor to be in the proper region so we can make an amplifier out of it. The schematic symbol for an electret microphone is shown here in this yellow box. Here's our diaphragm and back plate. Looks like a capacitor. And then we've got a sound wave coming in, causing a deforming of the diaphragm, creating a change in voltage. And that's applied to the input of a junction field effect transistor. And it takes that voltage and converts it into a current. Now for this to work properly, we have to place it in what's called its active region. And we do that with a battery and a resistor. We'll talk about how to do this in ECE 302. But what you get out here is a DC level. And then added to that is the change in voltage on the microphone amplified. Now this turns out not to be big enough for what we want to do in our circuit, so I'm going to have to amplify it again. But whatever I hook up here, I don't want to affect this. Let's use an amplifier with a very high input resistance. Maybe a logical choice would be a non-inverting amplifier. Now besides having a high input resistance, I also want to block the DC level coming from that biasing network. And the reason is that once we amplify the sound, we're also going to amplify that DC level, and if that then is applied to the headphone, it's going to cause the diaphragm in that headphone to also deflect or to move. There won't be any sound, so it's going to cause it to go to one extreme or the other. Typically, you use capacitors to block the DC level and just bring the AC signal in and then amplify it. So let's add a capacitor to block DC coming from our microphone. I'm going to add a resistor back to ground to get a little bit of current that can flow into this plus terminal. Even though ideally the current in here is zero, there is a small current that's needed to bias the amplifier. Now as frequency goes up, this capacitor will eventually become a short circuit, and I want this resistor much bigger than the resistance looking back into the microphone circuit. Let me call this combination of R and C just Z1. Whatever voltage is present here, the output voltage is gonna be one plus R2 over the impedance of Z1 times this voltage. You can also write that as Z1 plus R2 divided by Z1. What's this voltage? Well, because this current is very, very small, it's got a voltage divider with V microphone. So that's going to be R3 over the impedance of the capacitor C2 plus R3 times V microphone. Now let's put the values of the impedances in. Divide by V microphone, and Z1 is 1 over SC1 plus R1, and then R2, and then 1 over SC1 plus R1. R3, 1 over SC2, plus R3. Let's multiply numerator and denominator of this first term by SC1, so I'll get a 1, and then R1 plus R2 times SC1, and then the denominator, 1, and then SC1 times R1. 
For this second term, let's multiply numerator and denominator by SC2. So I get SC2R3 divided by 1, and then SC2R3. Now if I can pick this term here to equal this term, they'll cancel. To do that, I would need to set C1 times R1 plus R2 equal to C2R3. When I do that, then again, this drops out, and I just simply have SC2R3 divided by 1 plus SC1R1. If you recall from ECE202, this is the form of a high-pass filter. In other words, when the frequency is high enough, the numerator, of course, is just this, but the denominator is dominated by this term here because S is equal to J omega, and as omega is getting larger, it's much, much greater than 1. And so what you then get is just this term divided by this term, and the S is canceled and used to approach a constant. As the frequencies get lower, this becomes small compared to 1, and then we just have j omega times c2r3. Frequency gets lower and lower, then this voltage transfer function gets smaller and smaller. So we block low frequencies and we pass higher frequencies. In ECE202, in chapter 12, around pages 3 to 11, we learned about an inspection technique for sketching transfer functions like this. Now you may have already gotten to that material, or are about to get to it, so I'll leave this as an exercise to sketch the magnitude and angle of this versus frequency. And this is shown below on page 8. The technique in the notes is the dotted line that's shown here, and likewise for the angle. The actual curve approaches these asymptotes smoothly, no sharp corners, and that's what the Bode plots would look like for the magnitude of the voltage gain and the angle versus frequency. Let me interpret what we see here. This corner frequency is at 1 over 2 pi r1 c1, and what that means is that when the frequency is high enough, in other words, greater than this value, we approach a constant gain, and here it's labeled as r1 plus r2 over r1 and the phase angle is approaching zero degrees. Now, if we go back and look at the schematic, we can see the same thing. As the frequency goes up, this capacitor will eventually become a short circuit, and this microphone voltage will be the plus terminal voltage of the non-inverting amplifier. Likewise, this capacitor becomes a short, and then the gain from V out to eventually V microphone is just gonna be equal to one plus R2 over R1, as we saw in the Bode plot, with a phase angle of zero. Now, also take a look at this transfer function and see if we see the same thing. As the frequency goes up, the numerator is just S C2 R3, but the denominator, as I mentioned before, is just gonna get larger than this. So the ratio is just this as the frequency goes up. The S's cancel and have C2 R3 divided by C1 R1. But there was also a constraint on the capacitor values. Let's take a look at this at the bottom of page eight. So again, here's where we're approaching as frequency gets higher and higher. But with this constraint, we could substitute in then for our values of C1 and C2. So here's my C2 R3 over C1 R1. And then with this constraint here, C2 divided by C1 is equal to R1 plus R2 divided by R3. The R3s cancel and we get one plus R2 over R1. So the Bode plot, the transfer function, and the circuit itself are all telling us the same things. As the frequency goes up, it approaches a constant gain with an angle of zero.